I'm Judy Clem, and on behalf of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory, we are delighted to welcome you all to learn about how to grow pawpaws and about the history of the pawpaw tree. As part of the Friends mission, we really want to help educate and inspire gardeners to become more confident in their endeavors. And hopefully tonight we'll do just that. We'll, get, we'll really um, give you some knowledge so that you can feel confident when you make that purchase of the new um, pawpaw tree and work it into your native landscape. This happens to be the last of our fall lecture series, and we've had such a great run this season, and um, I'm delighted to say that we have recorded all of our programs, and they can be found on our website, fopcom.org, and so you can learn about chili peppers and garlic and all the other programs that we've had um, that were on Zoom um, there on our website for your enjoyment. Um, coming soon, you might see on the slideshow that I've got showing now, uh, the winter greens market is coming and we will have a wide array of colorful ornamentals to help create your um, winter container gardens. So please support the Oak Park Conservatory by shopping for all of your festive winter greens. The winter greens market will be open November 18th to uh, December 18th and probably closed for a couple of days around um, Thanksgiving and it will also be available online as well as in person. I highly recommend coming in person because then you can see and pick out everything that you want but um, either way um, come visit the conservatory and support the winter greens. So um, we are now ready to introduce our special guest this evening. Kelsey Thaw is jo joining us tonight from Possibility Place in Moni, Illinois, where he's the botanist and the sales consultant there. He has a Bachelor of Science in Botany from Eastern Illinois University and has been doing work in the industry for more than 25 years. Kelsey has taught classes on native plants, lectured about their uses and environmental impacts, and he handles the bulk of the consulting projects, large and small, for Possibility Place. I also want to mention that um, Casey Nikoloff is our co-host this evening, and she will manage the chat where you can put all of your questions. And at the end of Kelsey's talk, we will um, open it up for Q&A and um, hopefully get all of your questions answered. So um, without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Kelsey and um, he can share his screen when he's ready. Uh, rolling. Just, I'm sorry, I'm running a second behind you all. And I had okay. to pull something up because it went out of my head. Okay. Well, I see something behind you on your screen that looks familiar. So, at least oh, yeah, I might as well go with the theme, right? <laughs> all right. Take it away. All right. Are we ready to go? Sweet. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. I am Kelsey. Uh, I am one of the owners, and like she said, a botanist with Possibility Place Nursery, and for 25 years, it's been way longer than that now. I, I got to update that on the website, I guess. Uh, and tonight, um, we are going to be doing a quick talk on the basics of pawpaw. Uh, Semina triloba is our locally common species. Nationwide, there are roughly... 10 species, most of which uh, don't go outside the deep south, particularly Florida, of which there are, I think, five endemic species limited to about seven or 10 counties. It's kind of an interesting plant. It is definitely a botanic anachronism, as it, it, by when I say that, it is something that has been left behind by time. It exists in a way that doesn't truly coincide with the biology uh, of today's fauna. Uh, there are very few pollinators that are actually known. Um, they and and the way that it the way that it is interacted with now is mostly with us and the smaller mammals. Uh, at one point in time, this thing clearly had a much bigger friends. Uh, the the megafauna of this particular continent was definitely something that used this plant. It's nature. The way that it suckers up after it is damaged. Uh, the, it will. It waits in in wooded areas for sunlight to come in, and then resprouts in thick clumps and thickets. It's a truly interesting plant. Not only that, it is our largest native fruit. So, in other words, you know, uh, people will think apples or whatever not native, right? 
and the way that you think. These things, the pawpaw can get in excess of a pound, uh, which puts it in the shape of a very large potato. And to collect it, you're kicking a 30 to 40 foot tree, especially downstate Illinois. And that, you know, when you're releasing fruit from the top of it, you have to duck and cover, or otherwise it'll knock you senseless. So you have to be very, very careful when you're harvesting this. You also have to understand that pawpaw is one of those things that likes to be in nature. It will grow in your yard, and we're going to discuss that, and hopefully we're going to hit up to, uh, as much as I can about it. But it is definitely one of those plants that likes to be out, you know, with its friends, uh, high canopy trees and all. And we've been growing at a possibility place now since I was a kid, so 40 plus years and we always used to collect it locally. Uh, there are many different populations around. And when we would collect it, we wanted to make sure that it was local source because that's that's part of our ethic at Possibility Place is to make sure that any of our woody materials and any of our available herbaceous materials will be collected as local as possible so that when people are putting things back into their yards or into their wild spaces that it is coming from at least northeast Illinois, uh, sometimes a little bit beyond that because we have to, but in general, that's what we try to do. So with pawpaw, what we're going to be talking about tonight is what is it, right? Most people are at least a little bit familiar with it, but there's a lot of things that I have to give a lot of, we'll call it um, phone time for answering general questions. It is one of, if not the most iconic fruit that people know from the new world. Uh, it, allegedly, it was the favorite dessert of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. It was used by a myriad of native peoples far before that. And it was only first, you know, made or brought to light in the, what was in the mid 1500s when the DeSoto expedition uh, crossed the southern part of the United States and was exposed to it for the first time. But it really wasn't described as a genus until the mid 1700s when uh, a guy named Addison uh, first described it in one of his books. And he uh, took a new, uh, he diverged uh, in describing it in, in a way that kind of slightly broke with uh, the taxonomic terms used at the time, especially uh, those popularized by Linnaeus. He used terms that were, uh, we'll call it um, less graphic and more on point for what his species, the ones that he you know, did work on. And that was the first published work, but that wasn't until hundreds, if not thousands, well, most likely thousands of years uh, after the you know, human interaction with the plant actually started to occur. Now, I really only have about 35 minutes. So to begin with, for all of you that, wondering, that are wondering about what pawpaw is, it is a tree, kind of, but not really, but mostly. So you have to understand that when you are going to engage with this plant in your yard, that it is going to be tricky because of its nature. It likes to sucker up on fairly rich soil ground. So if you have a ground that is in shade, it is perfectly happy to be there. However, if it's too dry, it does very weird things to this plant. It keeps it short, single stem, the ground's too compacted. And we're gonna, I'm gonna show you what that means in just a minute. But once you plant this in your yard, you have to understand that it is not going to be a reliable tree forming plant from native sources. You may get that from some of the cultivars. I like the native stuff because of its unpredictability. Um, if you lose a stem, give it a year, you'll have three more. So it is just one of those plants that responds to itself and its environment fairly well. However, when you're finding it in nature, you're going to be finding it on the floodplain, almost always. Um, either that or in pan woods, 
see you know near seeps are at least our local variety that's the semina trilova and you're going to be finding it in these high canopy situations now downstate you're going to find it more uh, associated with the you know your maple your basswood you know your 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 truly weird southern floodplain species i, I found it growing next to uh, bald cypress it, it, it's it, it's a creature that takes advantage of openings so once you find it you're going to find not just one you'll find many however it might still only be one individual has a tendency to make these weird thickets and it can grow in very deep shade it prefers say like half day it likes those openings in the canopy however i have found it fruiting in deep shade uh here in will county if you want to take a drive out to uh um just went out of my head mckinley woods it's all through there and you can find it in fairly deep shade against some very large trees Hang on, guys. Let's give Kelsey a minute. Looks like he he froze up a bit. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. Okay. Uh, so it, it does do okay. Uh oh, my internet's my, apparently. I'm getting a notice that my internet is unstable. I'll get it some pills later. No, I lost my place. My part, my it, it, anyway. It does well on our urban soils as long as the soil is rich or has been enriched for it. If it is happy, it will sucker, and you should get multiple sims, you know, ascending into your canopy, and it will grow inside of itself. So, in other words, a lot of plants don't like to grow in their own shade. Pawpaw is perfectly happy to do that. It'll absolutely do that for you. If you want fruit. You can plant one, but you really probably need two or more, just so you get that cross pollinization. You're looking for multiple individuals that will give you better success as far as yield goes. Anybody that thinks they're going to be planting it for permaculture, I wish you luck. Uh, it is a wonderful plant to have in the quiver, so to speak, but it is not going to be a big time winner for you uh, in, in that regard. The fruit is only good for a little while. In nature, you're talking about it, it once it hits the ground, a couple of days, it starts to decompose rather quickly. And the seed dispersal is usually from things like squirrels and possum, um, any of your, even gray, gray and red foxes, they, they're going to be going after this thing fairly, you know, heavily. So multiple plants are recommended for human consumption. But if you're worried about like spacing, for example, you can put actually two individuals in the same hole and their, you know, their problem then goes away. Just pretend it's multi-stemmed. Okay. And for starters, you don't have to start big. I brought an example here. This is a one gallon pot. The green is uh, a new product that we're, we're working on. It's a decomposable pot. Uh, it takes a long time, but it does. But the plant itself here, you can see, is only about, well, I don't know if you can see, but it's only about 24 inches tall. And this particular one is about, and again, maybe half an inch in diameter. This is a two-year-old plant. If you're looking for fruit production, this plant should fruit in about three to five years. Okay, and it won't be heavy at first. And the trick to it is, is that you don't prune it. The flowers are produced on second year wood. All right. So last year's new growth is this year's flowering plant or flowering surface, flowering something. You know what I mean? And that's where those are going to come from. All right. So if you if you're doing heavy pruning on it, you are further going to uh, we'll call it hurt your capacity to experience the fruit. In urban settings, you have to be very careful. You can see that these are, I don't know how well you can see this picture. I took this uh, out of a moving car, my apologies. But you can see that these plants are very thick. They're not suckering a whole lot. And they're very low to the ground. This is a in full sun, very exposed. 
you can see the frost cracking. Um, I, don't, I don't have a pointer, but if you look at the tree, uh, <laughs> look at it right there. No, uh, the one to the right, I guess, you can see the big split in the trunk. When you get heavily, and when it gets heavily exposed, especially from the north, it can get penetrated and it will erupt the bark. So once that happens, if the tree is healthy, it should heal over just fine. It's just that that kind of exposure will further diminish your ability for that plant to be a healthy producer for you. What you're looking for is something a little bit more like this. And I know this is, uh, again, unfortunately, I, to my ultimate shame, I do not have fantastic shots of uh, groves of pawpaw. I will rectify that in the future. But what you're looking for is multiple different sizes of pawpaw stems in the same community. You can see there's things here as big as the one gallon that I just showed you to the large one here in the middle uh, there. Again, I'm, again, can't see. But um, that one there is approximately eight, uh, six to eight inches across. So you're looking at plants that are three to four foot tall and plants that are 25 feet tall all together in their own little community. There are two, only two individuals in this picture. I can assure you of that. So even though you'll see many stems, there's still only two individuals here. The plant has grown, died to the ground and regrown itself many, many times. So every time it's had an opportunity to put up a, you know, put up a sucker, it absolutely will. And to go along with that, you see a lot of people, um, they give me calls and they, they say, well, I really want pawpaw, but is it pretty? And that that's one of those subjective things. As, as a botanist, of course, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of almost all plants. Pawpaw in particular is somewhat interesting to me because of its you know kind of transient nature. Even if the main plant dies, give it a year or two and it'll fill that space back in. So for me, I love the fall color. I love the flower. The, the fruits are interesting. There's a lot of things that kind of go into this. When it flowers, it flowers very early in the year. These burgundy, chocolatey, velvety, purpley flowers. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking you can see that there. Um, that hang down in these, you know, we'll call them bells. There's a mild fetid smell to them. So they have that kind of um, smell of hot death, I guess. You know, uh, you gotta, gotta really get your nose in there to appreciate it, but it, it, you know, it, it's in there. And that brings in a set of pollinators that you wouldn't expect. When you see a larger flower like this, and then these are a little bit, if you were going to give them a, a circumference, they'd be about the size of a quarter, okay? For, and for a tree, that's not an insignificant little flower. That's a pretty good one. And, they're, and a healthy one, there'll be many of them all over, these, all over the stems. And they're pollinated by these tiny, tiny flies and some beetles. Uh, I, if I remember correctly, there's only about four truly known pollinators for this plant where they get deep into the flower and have that you know true association instead of like oh look there's that guy this year or that you know is this beetles in there this year or whatever is it more of a throughout the range there are only there's a very few species that actually truly interact with the flower on a regular basis throughout the range of the united in the united states which makes it kind of uh we'll call it keystone for those uh, for those species the leaves they're, they're tropical. They can be very big. Sometimes six to 10 inches long is kind of like, we'll call it the average. The six is small, 10 is kind of medium, but they'll be in that 12, uh, 12 inch range if you're lucky on a big healthy plant and about you know, four to six inches wide, depending. Now, the more shade it gets, the wider the leaf will tend to be and there'll be fewer of them. They also get this nice umbrella shape and shade. When they're exposed to sunlight, they thicken up top to bottom. So you'll have, you can see in the fall color picture here on the left, it's very thick looking, even though when the leaves fall off, you can see straight through all the way to the back of the bed because the, ste the, the trunk and stems just disappear into nothingness. Whereas when they're in shade, they form these beautiful kind of like, we'll call them woodland umbrellas. And it's 
is kind of it's kind of endearing about it because you'll still get that growing in its own shade you'll still get the small ones but those definitely be these larger ones that that kind of overtop the group and kind of we'll call it give them protection from the rain kind of look it's a very attractive plant and i feel that it is not as appreciated for its beauty rather than its uniqueness as you know that fruit and speaking of that fruit there they are the fruit, like I said before, in our area, six to 10 ounces is pretty much common. They're not very big. You're talking about uh, four inches long, you know, not real big. And then you get the, you know, then you'll get bigger ones. They're about the size of a baseball. And, you know, they don't weigh a lot. You get downstate, however, they can get, I've collected them as big as a pound, pound and a quarter. And I got to tell you, that thing whistling from the canopy will get your attention in a hurry. Okay, so if you're, you know, if you're into pawpaw, making a, a making a trip down south to get the big ones, it's like fishing, I guess, would be, you know, worth a weekend. Just make sure you're not doing it illegally. And the the fruit itself um, can be ripened in a, you know, same way you ripen bananas. So you can stick them in a uh, paper bag. Typically this year, it didn't work so well. For whatever reason, they didn't ripen like they normally do. It was a very peculiar year. Um, when you do get them ripe, however, you'll smell them. Um, they'll smell ripe. That's when it's time to eat them. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Oh, yes, we will. Look at that. When you cut the fruit open, it ha it'll have like a, it'll if it's not ripe it'll be like this green color and if you do lick it you're a brave person one because your face will do one of these it's like oh you know uh it was puckery i believe you know and they tend to ripen later they're not an early fruit so you're talking about up here where we usually collect them early to mid-september OK, and if you're going to be collecting them, they need to be set out, especially if you're going to shake the tree for them. If you find them on the ground, you're going to find them in various uh, uh, we'll call it uh, moments of decom uh, decomposition. The softer the fruit, the more pungent the taste. So and pungent's not really a good word. We'll call it the uh, more distinct the taste because it's it doesn't taste pungent. It, it, it has a very. Like, like I said here, it's 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 got, I said, I don't know what it tastes like Mike. I have no idea who Mike is. That was a misprint on my part. My apologies. Uh, it tastes like a mix of banana, apple, and I guess cantaloupe. That was the only thing I could think of off the top of my head because it's got that kind of that mildly sweet smell and they're both kind of orange, I guess. Um, you want to make sure that if you are going to eat it, do not eat the seeds. They will make you ill, All right? You're going to want to skin it, and you're going to want to scoop those seeds out. Um, every year, I collect these things. I make ice cream. We've made pancakes. It's very good stuff. My daughter loves it, you know? Uh, in fact, I have had to make uh, almost a, about a gallon of the stuff this year just to make her happy through the winter. And... I, I have to be honest with you, the ease that I see people popping these seeds out on YouTube, just ugh, it is very infuriating to me because I can never get them to just pop right out. It makes me nuts. But once the seed, uh, once the seed has been skinned, uh, and the easiest way, frankly, is to cut them in half, pop the seeds out, save the seeds, chuck them back where you got them, um, and then scoop the fruit and, and run it. I would run it through. Uh, me personally, I run it through like a food mill, um, something like a pulper so that you're because you're thinning out a, a lot of the, the fibers and everything like that there and making it more into a cream mixture. Uh, store it in the fridge in ice cube trays. Easiest way to do it. You can store them forever. And that it well, not forever. Anyway, uh, but that way you'll know exactly how much you use in your recipes Usually one ice cube represents about a quarter, maybe a half of a pawpaw, depending on the size. But people have been eating these things forever. And, you know, uh, 
And there's a good reason for it. The custard apple family, which Pawpaw comes, comes from, has one of those families that has relatives all over the place. You, uh, the ones that are most interesting uh, come from, you know, your Southern Pacific Islands and like, uh, you know, Southern Asia. Um, and th those things like soursop, for example, uh, they've been eaten by the native peoples out there and, and, and even today in the same fashion that they've always been eaten. And Pawpaw, thankfully, is making a comeback here. So I'm kind of excited about that. Do make sure that it is right before you do any work with it at all. <clears throat> so that you know that I'm not cheating you. Here is a pawpaw uh, ice cream recipe. I do, this is not quite the one I use. Uh, we use a vanilla ice cream base. We like to make it more of a custard cr ice cream rather than a ice cream ice cream because this way the, the flavor is richer, just FYI. And uh, I don't care what kind of ice cream maker you use, but make sure that you add the pawpaw after your ice cream has started to set up. A lot of them call for just ah, throw it in there. What, what we have found is it'll actually settle down to the bottom. So you'll have a lot of pawpaw ice cream at the bottom and eh, kind of pawpaw at the top. So just, uh, you know, FYI. It is a, I don't really know how to describe how people have interacted with this over time because it has so many names, it has so many different interactions from so many different, you know, micro cultures around the United States, you know, today, you know, back then, and then way back then, you know, the paw, it, 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 the name Pawpaw actually derives from probably a mispronunciation of papaya, because that's what they thought it was when they first saw it. However, the native peoples here have had some just crazy crazily crazy descriptive names for it which i uh, frankly i i would butcher if i tried to say it but they are truly fantastic the way that they it, it, it's important to their culture each individual group had very specific names for this plant they would actually farm them and a lot of probably the northern populations in illinois were brought up to these areas and then seeded in so that they would be near enough to where they would be able to collect them. So they would be part of their culture, no matter where they were at that particular point in time. Um, it, is, <laughs> it has had a lot of cultural impacts beyond the native peoples that lived here. There's taken, I think 20, I think I count, I stopped counting at over 20, 20 towns or we'll call them, you know, municipality areas are named Pawpaw in some way or another. There are over 20 counties and townships alone that are called Pawpaw. Every state from Illinois to New York, south to Georgia, have a Pawpaw in them of some kind or another. Not all of them are incorporated, by the way, which was something I learned today. This, the plant itself has been a curiosity for a long time, uh, taken all over the world, in fact. The seeds for this plant are even, they were called, uh, for those of us old enough to remember what a pocket thing is, uh, or a worry stone, the seeds were used that way. The, they were also laced into necklaces. There were even songs about this, and if you're interested, I will play it for you, but I warn you, um, it's not good. I want it to be, but it's not good. Is it everybody want to hear this for a second? Anyone? All right. Let me give me one second here. Sweet little Nelly, where oh where is sweet little Nelly? Way back under the pop of that. Come on, boys, let's go find her. Come on, boys. Fascinating, right? Come on, boys, let's go find her. Way down yonder in the pop pop patch. Taking up pop pop, put them in your pocket. Taking up pop pop, put them in your pocket. Taking up pop pop, put them in your pocket. Way down yonder in the pop pop patch. Take it. I think that's enough, don't you? All right. <laughs> uh oh, I've lost my share. Uh oh. 
I knew this was going to happen. Hang on one second. Let me try this one more time. Sorry, everybody. Where'd it go? Uh oh. Hmm. Are we back? All right. Sorry, I don't know exactly what happened there. Anyway, for anybody interested in giving us a, uh, a, a jaunty little tune later, um, you know, feel free, but I'm not sticking around for this. Uh, it's It goes on for five minutes, too, and it's all the choruses there are. They don't even change names. It is what it is, right? Oops. There we go. For those of us, though, uh, moving on. <laughs> Sorry. For those of us that have a uh, kind of like a deeper appreciation of what the pawpaw is, if for for someone like me, yeah, sure, eating it's great, that's fine. Uh, its cultural impacts are are truly profound, really, for a fruit that not many people until recently have started to like kind of re-examine. Um, by the way, the I think it's the University of Kentucky, just FYI, has had a test plot to develop new pawpaw strains for we'll call the uh you know longer lasting fruits better tasting fruit kind of like an apple orchard now since the late 80s i believe and it's the longest running pawpaw study in the country it's a fascinating uh kind of field of study that you have to really be zeroed in on something anyway wildlife impact is something that is more dear to me than actually eating it uh, because the plants and animals that that truly interact with it are super cool. So like I said, once the fruit starts to fall, you get a lot of mammal species. So the cool part about that is, is that they seem to come together for it. Uh, when the when there's a lot of fruit on the ground, I've witnessed personally things like skunks, raccoons, and gray fox all at the same tree, all at the same time, completely uninterested in one another, just grabbing a fruit and you know doing what they do with it so it, it's kind of like a, a cool interaction but the coolest thing for me and what i didn't find out until later is is the box turtles will actually seek them out and eat them up where they're available and wherever there's still box turtles um you know which is kind of depressing but you know uh the box turtles, I, I actually inherited some from a um, uh, some friends a while ago, and to give them as natural an enclosure as possible, I kept uh, them near a pawpaw plant. And what they did was tear the fruit apart the, the instant they hit the ground, which I had no idea that that was an inner, even a thing until much later when I started reading about the, you know, the, the the, the way that wildlife interacts with this. It's also really cool that there are very specific host species for the pawpaw sphinx, which is a cool one. I don't have a picture that I own, so I didn't put it up here. But the pawpaw sphinx caterpillar is this really cool looking caterpillar. It's got some wavy, it's very wavy. It's got a nice pointy, uh, looks like it's got a sword sticking out the back. It, it is a very cool looking caterpillar. And also the zebra. Uh, swallowtail. They are very specific to pawpaw. Uh, we're a little far north for the zebra. Uh, we only see the uh, pawpaw sphinx very infrequently, and we only get the zebra up here when it is very, very warm, or if you're way out on the Illinois River, uh, much further west of here. And they'll show up, and they truly do go after the pawpaw. They've laid eggs on ours at the nursery, and turn them into shreds. And since we don't spray um, insecticides or miticides at the nursery, they, we just kind of have to let it happen. Um, it, it's something that we believe is important that we don't impact these native species in a negative way. So if they're going to interact with our plants, we hope that our customers understand that other things use them too, you know, and that it is a, a, an active ecosystem that we're contributing to, not just this. So when you're planting this, it's not just for you. It's also for uh, uh, for the animals in your yard. Now, we talked about the flowers earlier. Uh, like I said, it does have light whiffs of hot garbage. It really does. 
Uh, you really have to put your nose in it to get it, however. So it, you're might, you may not get a lot of it, but the bugs that do go in there, they're very dedicated to their mission. And <laughs> the fruit and regenerative nature of this plant, we've just kind of discussed and we've touched on before, where these plants, they take advantage of any opening they can get. If you go out to Starb Rock out in LaSalle County, uh, there is a wonderful pawpaw grove out there with trees that you know, are a solid 12 to 14 inches across, 30 feet tall at a minimum. You have to hike out there to get, I think it's out by a pass or out toward LaSalle Canyon and you hike through the middle of them. And it's probably just a handful of individuals, but there's gotta be 200 stems. And every now and then a storm will come through, knock half of them down five years later, they're all just as big and beautiful as they were before. So they, they, could, they continue to contribute to that, that natural cycle in a very positive way. The wood breaks down fairly quickly once it hits the ground, so it helps also enrich that soil. But we shouldn't forget the largest of the pawpaw consumers. I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember this, but you know, even Blue the Bear talks about you know, not using a claw on the big pawpaw because you got to shake the tree and that's how you get the fruit. And a lot of animals, they know what's up. Once that fruit is there, they're in your yard. I embrace it, just stay away from the skunks. And that's all I have today. I, it was a short turnaround, so I didn't get as much into this as I really wanted to. I'm hoping this was illuminating for some people. And uh, what kind of questions do we have? Yeah, well, thank you so much, Kelsey. That was um, just a super fun uh, learning experience. I know I learned a lot today um, and just we're very grateful for your um, time and expertise. We do have a number of questions um, in the chat. Perfect. So um, I will just start at the top. Um, Judy had a question, um, just kind of getting started. Um, do you need to stake seedlings when they're two years or younger? No, um, no. Okay. Uh, pawpaw is one of those plants where um, it's not when it's young it doesn't really have form that you should worry about it's going to get as big or as little as it feels like so it's going to have um, uh, the, the, we'll call it that first three years usually is this weird kind of like uh, maturing process for that plant and once it starts to go and we at the nursery, we're able to do certain things that you're not going to be able to do at home because we can, um, you know, we have ideal growing conditions, especially for the root zone where it, it, you're, you know, you're putting it into a soil mixture that is going to be a little different. So the plant itself uh, should have enough mass, that if, if you, especially if you're buying it from us. If you're buying it bare root, maybe, but if you're getting it from us, uh, there's enough mass in the root ball to hold the top up because there's not a lot of stems even with all the leaves on it, once it's in the ground, it takes a lot to force it over. So, um, you know, it's also one of the few plants that I would say that you don't need to cage as much. I've only had in, in all my years, that's, that's a weird thing to say, but it, in all my years of working with this plant, I would recommend caging it against deer before I would recommend staking it, no matter how big the plant was, before, you know, to put in, because I know if it falls over, it's just going to root and come up again anyway. So um, when they're young like this, though, I wouldn't bother. Just let it be. Um, maybe throw a cage around it, just out of general principle. Great, thank you for that answer. That's very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, Judy um, also asked a question. So um, we know, or at least I think you may have mentioned that. Um, you know, they're kind of a little bit of a hardier species when it comes to insects and um, possibly diseases, but um, are Japanese beetles a threat to the health of the pawpaw? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, Japanese beetle, um, American linden, clearly. Um, weirdly, swamp white oak, uh, but only when it's uh, putting on new growth, you know, things like that. It does, uh, in my experience, um, then there's a, there's a mild neurotoxin, I think it is, um, it, it's a, and, a, it starts with an A, forgive me. It's in the family of chemicals, uh, or, um, uh, of, um, uh, uh, it's in a family that has detrimental effects to browsers, to the leaves and stems. 
Um, so I, I, I don't think that there's a big, you know, aside from certain kinds of caterpillars, I don't think that you have a, a, a worry there. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. Um, and then MB here um, is asking if you could clarify, um, do pawpaws bear fruit at around three to five years or was it, was there another time frame? Three to five years. Three to five. Perfect. Thank you. Um, uh, and then... yeah, well, and, uh, to, and to that point, um, you do need multiple individuals if you're going to do this, and frankly, unless you have a local population that's within flight uh, and we're talking for flies that size, I, I wish I could tell you, like if it was a bumblebee, you know, two miles, fine, you're, you're going to be okay. However, for something like that, if you're going to try and create that local population, two to three individuals, and if you don't have space for it, again, just plant them in the same hole, they'll be fine. There are no gnomes or fairies that move things to the perfect distance apart. You can really put them in. They can become quite the family. Perfect. That's a great tip. Um, and then uh, Xenia here um, notes that they love Ananasea's fruits or the custard apple family. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're curious um, how big of a difference there is in logistics with regards to shipping for um, Cherimoya versus Papa. Shipping, like like across the country, around the world, or what? What kind of shipping are we talking about? Yeah, I, that is a good question. Because well, well, well because of, yeah, because the well, the shelf life of a pawpaw is very short. Okay, uh, that's why a lot of times when you go to farmers markets and stuff like that, you're finding the pulp. You're not finding, yeah, you know, and a lot of times it'll be pre-frozen and it'll be like kept in a co in a cooler and it'll be handed out you know in chunks you know kind of like uh not, it won't not like dry ice but it'll be you know it'll be like a an ingot of pawpaw pulp because it it, it does the the fruit itself getting fresh pawpaw if you're if you pick it that morning and you put it out on the table you're probably fine but generally speaking if you're trying to increase the shelf life of pawpaw uh, against some of the other custard apples that have, you know, some of the custard apple family, they have fairly thick skin and uh, they last longer in their environment than the pawpaw does. I think it has something to do with the pawpaw coming ready at certain times of year and the fact that whatever animal that the pawpaw developed itself with, uh, they took advantage of them right away. And so I don't think that there's there's no need to have it as a and, and not only that, but the latitude that it's at versus where the rest of the family is, the, the, the rest of the family, they produce over a much greater period of time where the pawpaw is ready in a week. If it's ready here, like in my yard today, I better get down the street to where I collect it at Bill's house or at the farm or wherever else I have to go because that, that, that fruit's going to be ready within two days of it being ready here. So it comes together as a group. So if you're on that line, all that fruit on that line should be ready at about the same time. So I'm hoping that answers the question, but. Perfect. Yes, um, Xenia, let us know if you have any follow-up questions um, with that, but thank you so much, um, Kelsey, for that answer. Um, and then, th so this is specific to possibility place, but um, Natalie is wondering if you happen to have any um, two to four. Oh yeah, um, yeah, we we do on mail order. I forgot that we just talked about this before. Um, it is a it is available on the website right now uh, via mail order. Uh, we will mail it right to your door. Um, if you wish to pick it up, place the order. Give us a call. Let us know what your order number is, and we'll we'll get it for you know we'll get it set aside. I do have a limited number of 10 gallon available as well. But uh, frankly, this year, you'd be better off buying the one gallon. Uh, if I have any um, come late summer and 10 gallon next year, then and you're looking for something a little larger to get started, then then that would be the good buy. Uh, right now, I, I'm, I just have a handful of the 10 gallon uh, available. So I would go with the one gallon simply for ease of use for the typical homeowner. And the fact that they're already two years old, so you only look at another two to three years before possibly your first pawpaw, you know, that, that'd probably be your, your best bet for the dollar spent at the moment. Sure, that makes sense. Well, 
Natalie, we hope you take advantage and others on the call and, and let us know how it goes if your pawpaw adventures. Um, yeah, if, if anybody yeah. does buy it, you know, uh, po you know, post it up, put it up on uh, Illinois Gar Illinois Native Gardening, I think, has a has a forum for it. Uh, they, they love talking about those kinds of plantings. So there'll be, you know, you'll get a lot of feedback right away on if you did it right or if you did it wrong, I guess, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, and then let's see. So Anne here um, has a 20 foot pawpaw tree that's producing suckers um, in an area where there's no room for such. Um, could you recommend the best way to separate the main tree from the offspring? Don't. Uh, the it if they're close into the main the main trunk, if you have a large one there. Your best bet is to leave them alone because, or to at least just nip them off at the ground and hope for the best. Because if you do uh, start going there with a shovel, the structural root damage that you po could possibly do could do real harm to the, you know, to the parent plant. And that's something that if you're, I, I would recommend against that if it were, if it were me. Um, you're you're better off just running your your mower real high through that area and and, and whack them, you know, off. It's going to leave a little stump. But if you're worried about suckering, then you know, um, pawpaw is definitely going to give you some challenges over time. I, I would personally, I, you let it kind of fill in, and you just mow the area around the where you don't want it to go anymore you make sure that it's mowed or maintained much you know further and you just let the suckers happen once that parent plant because again because that big part may just decide to pass on for no reason so if you let some certain a number of suckers come up and then help get into that canopy you're probably going to suffer we'll call it a a milder loss than you would otherwise Got it. That makes sense. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, Sandra, um, so this is not a pawpaw question, but um, <laughs> Sandra is wondering, are there any native apple trees? But it's true, right, that pawpaws are the only native. No, no, it's not the only native fruit. Um, well, technically, all angiosperms have fruit, and you can eat them, mostly, okay? Um, we do have a native apple, Malus iowensis and Malus uh, coronaria which are our native, they are crab apples, but you can eat them. Uh, they do make a nice sour mash for anybody here that's into, you know, make an apple brandy or whiskey. Um, but as far as like the, the, it is our largest native fruit. You, you also have uh, locally, well, well, locally, there's also the persimmon for the, anybody that likes persimmon. Me personally, I, no thank you, but um uh, my dogs love it. Uh, so, you know, you, you can go down that route. There are a number of other other uh, fruiting trees, walnut, for example, you know, uh, butternut and, uh, you know, American hazel, American plum. There are lots of fruiting plants that are culturally significant and have a long history of human interaction, you know, beyond um, settlement, uh, you know, pre especially into the pre-settlement area. Um, uh, of time. Uh, American plum, for example, is a truly, you know, wide ranging plant. It's every, it was, it was everywhere and it, it has been diminished significantly and it continues to be diminished because a lot of our farm fields are being taken over by, we'll call it you know, progress. And they're just whacking down uh, these drainage areas where a lot of these remnant populations still exist. And the, the loss environmentally is pretty significant as far as the loss of, you know, fruiting, flowering plants. And it is hurting our local environments in, in ways that I really hope people start to understand a lot better. The pawpaw is kind of like a, we'll call it the enigmatic member of that particular group because it has very particular needs. It likes that high canopy part day, you know, sun, shade, moisture. It, it, so it, it likes very particular things where a lot of these other species that are far more common, you know, across a wider range of habitats that are good fruit for those of you that like to eat them. Um, 
the, the, those losses are going to be far more profound further on down the line than the loss of, you know, a couple of pawpaw colonies here and there. Well, the American plum is a hugely important pollinator species, hugely important. You know, the, you know, the black cherry is in that same family. The, uh, the uh, choke cherry is in that family. There's a lot of very key species that, that are just being cleared out because of reasons. I, I, I can't tell you why, but those are going to be truly hurtful later on. The pawpaw lives in an area uh, where they're far less impacted. So if there's a remnant population on a floodplain, if even if the water table comes up because you know we're putting down more concrete up system, it's still going to be okay, mostly, okay, unless it gets washed away, where these other species are going to be far more impacted, and that's kind of depressing. And what do we got? Anything positive? <laughs> yeah, well, that that's a very important message. So we had. No, thank you for sharing that. And, and I'm um, a guy. I'm, I'm going to need a beer now. <laughs> Um, well, how, how about this? Um, could you talk a little bit about just general um, care tips? So, oh, how the pawpaw? water? Yes. How okay. water? Most when you plant, water when you're fish? planting a pawpaw this size, this time of year, it's always best to water it in. Uh, never, never dig a hole deeper than the pot it comes in. All right. In fact, it should probably be a little shallow. So when you're doing your math, shallow is less than the pot size. And I know that's may sound, uh, we'll call it um, semantical, but uh, you'd be surprised if the pot measures 11 inches, make sure the hole's only 10 inches. So it just sticks up just a little so that those roots that are shallow will tend to run along, you know, run along into the ground that is, you know, freshly prepared for it on top in the, in, into that mulch. So that you have a chance for suckering and to start to create that, you know, that mini community that you're looking for. The root system is fairly significant on the pawpaw. So the more you can break up the ground, especially in more compacted areas, and the, the more organic matter that you can add. And I don't normally say add a lot of organic matter, but on the pawpaw, it is beneficial. Okay. So if you were, if you're, you know, normally I tell people to, if you're going to be planting uh, in an area that is nutrient deficient, you throw your compost down over the whole planting zone. Do not rototill it in. You let gravity take, you know, do the work for you. And then when you plant your plant your tree or your shrub or whatever, you dig through it. When you're doing the pawpaw, you, you, you know, and you only want to put down maybe an inch normally. But if you're doing a pawpaw, you can actually put down two inches under those same kinds of environment, um, uh, you know, instructions. So when you're planting, you still dig through your compost, but you have two inches on top instead of one. Pawpaw responds very, very well to higher organic matter environments. Um, it, a lot better than some species do. You know, normally you're only talking a couple of percentage points for for organic material, but with pawpaw, I mean. If you doubled it, it'd probably be fine. You know, it, it, they, they react very, very well to that. They, they, they tend to like it. The leaves break down very quickly and return to the soil very fast. So, you know, it, it has that nice regenerative, regenerative, re, that word uh, factor all on its own. Oh, and definitely water it in. Oh, pawpaw is one of those things. Um, you water the area, not the plant. So in times of drought, not, not after planting, water the plant clearly. Ooh, careful. Um, when you have prepared your area and you are doing your planting, next year, uh, when if it gets droughty like it did again, you water the area around the pawpaw, not just the plant itself. So if you're going to let the hose run on it, that's fine. That's great. That'll help it immensely. But you're much better off putting one of those little cone sprinklers right in that area and just watering that whole, you know, planting zone around it. So, you know, any of that three to four feet and just soak the ever loving heck out of it once or twice a week in times of drought. And you'll see a lot better results that way. Or you could put in drip irrigation and, you know, be, you know, we'll call it conscious of overwatering and wastefulness. Perfect. I'm hoping that helped. <laughs> yes, that was great. No, thank you so much. Um, and 
we i'm trying to think of the next great question here because we have we have a lot of interest and and thank you so much folks for um being engaged listeners um how about this um do you have any uh, resources that you'd recommend for more information on associated insect species okay um the illinois natural history survey has really good information on that um i think their generic website is like illinoiswildflowers.com or something like that um i had it here someplace um it, it, that that uh that resource is really good for um beginner knowledge it also has like a range map of you know it contained per per plant and it's not going to have every plant in illinois but things like the pop are, are you know explored and a lot of the associations that are most common are well done in that particular one um if you're looking for a local resource uh otherwise uh there's a book do i have a copy uh ha. uh some friends of mine put out a book a number of years ago and uh i spilled on my copy uh mike jeffords and sue post with james um weicker put out uh butterflies and Butterflies of Illinois, um, and that is going to have um, a lot of associate. Uh, it uh, that's going to have a lot of associate, uh, like kind of um, um, information in it as well. Uh, I'm going to have to have them sign me another copy. Uh, terrible. Um, anyway, uh, that'll also be helpful. And there's a number, like uh, I think the Xerxes Society also does something with it. And if you look on uh, the Lady Bird Johnson, but I think that's mostly, that might be the Southern, like Mobot does the same thing. I don't know how well their uh, faunal association lists are. I know that the Illinois Wildflowers ones does a very good job um, with, you know, Illinois specific, uh, or at least we'll call it Illinois, Indiana, Southern Wisconsin kind of complex, where they do a very, very good job of listing the associated insects and without going too deep into it, if you're curious about a particular insect, copy paste and do another search on it to, to find more about it. But it's a very good starting point as far as an online resource goes. Uh, as far as um, as far as like books, um, the uh, Butterflies of Illinois are really good, but there's also a pamphlet put out by the USDA. And I don't have that number in my head. I'll, I can share it with Judy um uh, is uh, you know in the next couple of days where she can blast it out to everybody it, it's a pamphlet and it's a numbered pamphlet and it has all the uh i believe it's all the eastern north american so from the mississippi east from florida to ontario uh all the known caterpillars and moths and their associated uh host plants and it's a pretty that's a really cool resource uh to find I just don't have a copy of it handy and I'm not gonna sorry I'm not gonna run off uh, off screen on you but those are really good uh, for that kind of thing or you could just talk to an entomologist you know you have oh, to find okay. them though they're like a unicorn anyway you were I was, uh, you, we only have a little bit left I think right yeah. so what else yeah. we got here well, I think um, what I'd like to do is, um, first of all, thank you for your time, your knowledge and energy for pulling the presentation together for us. And um, I think we are on the edge of our seats, just so excited to learn more about this interesting plant. And um, you did such a great introduction. So thank you so much. Um, no I would like to invite people if they're still interested in um, asking a couple more questions or saying hi, you can certainly unmute or turn on your video and we'll stay on for a couple more minutes um, as we wrap up here. And um, I just wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight. It was such a fun evening and um, we didn't expect such um, high interest in this plant, but it was great. And, it's uh, become it's become incredibly popular and yeah. I would caution everybody. Yeah. This is not a collector plant. This is not one of those you put in a pot, you take it for walks around the neighborhood. <laughs> this plant truly needs some you know, it, it does need a lot of love. It is a very durable plant, but it needs the kind of environment where you're going to be able to let it be what it is. Yeah. yeah, you saw you saw the pictures that I showed where people kind of wouldn't let it be what it is. They put it out and it got really round, really kind of weird looking. 
this plant likes to stretch. Mm -hmm. It likes that high canopy shade. It really likes those environments. And if you're going to plant it outside of that, you have to be aware that the other the other necessities for its well-being need to be met. So that that soil really needs to be rich. You got to make sure that it's not like just dry, sandy, you know, terrible stuff. It can't be planted, you know, on a driveway where you're going to salt the ever loving bejesus out of it. You have to make sure that all the other needs are met if you can't meet one in particular. Okay. So just, uh, you know, give it the kind of love it loves, love it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and it'll be, it'll do you very, very, it'll do you good. And when you collect it, process it right away. Otherwise uh, I made the mistake of leaving one in my truck and we'll just say that my truck to this day, a year and a half later smells no, not a half. Well, over a year later, it smells fruity. <laughs> and it doesn't go away. So, you know, those hydrofluorocarbons are, whew. And on hot days, especially during a rain, it gets, um, I'll go with the windows down. 